My name is Jorge Jaime, and I teach at the Pardee School. Let me welcome you to this book talk by Peter on Peter Martin's new book, China Civilian Army, The Making of World Warrior Diplomacy, published by Oxford University Press. This is an activity of the Rising Powers Initiative here at the Pardee Center for the Long Range Future, for the study of the Long Range Future. And I'm delighted we have such a distinguished panel on such a topical subject. I will get to our speakers in a moment. But let me first say a few words about Chinese diplomacy. There's much discussion today about China's economic expansion and its exponential growth. There's been less commentary about the rise of Chinese diplomacy. Let me share with you the following. As recently as 1966, that is a little over 50 years ago, China had exactly one ambassador in post abroad in Egypt. All others had been recalled by the Cultural Revolution. Yet in 2019, China became the country with the largest number of foreign missions abroad, surpassing the United States in number of embassies, consulates, and special representations. Even in an area as close to the United States as the Eastern Caribbean, China has four embassies and the United States has only one. We are thus talking about a massive expansion of China's diplomatic presence all over the world, something that has happened over a relatively short period of time at a time when many countries are cutting back on foreign ministry budgets and foreign representation, and ambassadors find themselves under fire, China is betting on diplomacy, drastically increasing its foreign ministry budget and empowering its diplomats. What does this mean and where is it heading to? To answer this question, we have today with us Peter Martin, formerly Bloomberg's Beijing correspondent, and now its defense and intelligence reporter in Washington, DC. Peter has written a deeply researched and illuminating book on the rise of Chinese diplomacy in the PRC era, all the way from Zhu and Lai onwards. This is a book based on many interviews and a vast amount of sources written with great verve and brio. The book provides many insights into the conduct of China's foreign relations, a subject that could not be more critical to the understanding of today's turbulent world. We also are lucky to have with us two noted sinologists and colleagues of mine here at the Pardee School to comment on the book and to bring to bear their own perspective on the subject on which they have written extensively themselves. I refer to Professor Min Ye, the author of a recent book, The Belt and Beyond, from Mobi sorry, Mobilized Globalization in China, 19. 98, 2018, and Professor Joseph Hughesmith, author of the recently published book, Rethinking Chinese Politics. We have a big audience today from many countries around the world. If you have any questions, you have a choice of putting them on the YouTube chat or tweet to the BU Pardi Center at BU Pardi Center or email them to party at bu.edu. Without further ado, let me leave with you, Peter Martin. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak um, virtually uh, about this. I'm, uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, so so I, I thought I'd kind of walk through why I, I wrote a book on this topic. And then um, we can discuss some of the key findings and, and I'm especially looking forward to, um, to the, discuss, the panel discussion and to the, to the Q and A, because I think that's always, um, that's always really good fun. So, you know, I, I, guess, I guess the context for writing this is that I, I arrived back in China uh, in early 2017 after spending a few years um, away. And, you know, of, of course, it was this extraordinary historical moment. You know, China was um, busy rolling out its Belt and Road Initiative. Its economy was beating estimates. Um, its military was, was in the process of setting up uh, its first overseas base in Djibouti. Um, and, and perhaps most importantly of all, uh, the Chinese government faced this, this kind of emerging power vacuum, uh, leadership vacuum globally as the Trump administration picked fights with US allies and um, with multilateral institutions. Um, 
so so it seemed to to be it seemed to be the case that China was kind of on the precipice of of, of taking on a new leadership role and really stepping into that void, but. The longer that this period of time went on, the, the clearer it became, um, I think, to everyone watching that, that China was really struggling to do that. You know, the country was um, incredibly impressive at offering economic inducements to others in order to achieve its objectives. And it was pretty effective at using coercive tactics in order to get others to, to agree with it internationally. But, but where it really struggled was this art of persuasion and the art of diplomacy and actually changing the minds of others. Um, and I kind of I kind of started to think a little bit about, you know, why is that um, and, and why does it matter? And I, I think the reason that it matters is that as we move into a world which is less and less dominated by any one single power, um, the, the ability to persuade others is going to command a, a tremendous premium in global politics. You know, every, every major power that aspires to global influence is going to need to have the art of diplomacy um, really at its fingertips. And I think the PRC has, has recognized that and is spending much more on diplomacy as a result, but it still kind of struggles with the implementation. And, um, you know, I, I started to kind of see Chinese diplomats really as a, as a microcosm of that much bigger problem um, that the PR faces, this struggle, the PRC faces, this struggle to communicate. And you, you can really see it when you interact on a personal level with, with Chinese diplomats. You know, they can be, um, you, we're talking about people who have studied at Georgetown and the London School of Economics. They speak Czech and Indonesian. They can be suave and funny and urbane. But uh, when they get up on the podium in the foreign ministry or when they sit down across the table from their US and other foreign counterparts, you really, um, you really get the sense that they switch into this kind of quite stilted and ideological and in recent years increasingly aggressive mode, um, which, uh, which can be rather, rather puzzling. And so I started to conduct interviews in Beijing, working there as a journalist. But I also started to look for primary sources in Chinese that could help me to understand where this kind of um, misfit between, you know, ca diplomatic capabilities and uh, an ambition came from. And I discovered this, this trove of more than 100 uh, memoirs written by former Chinese diplomats. Uh, kind of in dusty bookstores in Beijing and online um, secondhand bookstores. And, uh, you know, started to realize that although these books were highly censored and um, had been kind of put together under the watchful gaze of the Chinese party state, taken together, they could tell something about, um, about China's struggle to communicate with the world. And, you know, I'll be honest, when I started this project of writing a book about Chinese diplomats, this was a pretty niche, geeky uh, topic. And, you know, that was fine with me because I'm a pretty niche, geeky person. But uh, as, the, as the years went on, uh, Chinese diplomacy really became a very mainstream topic. And, and that was a, as a result, of course, of what we all now call wolf warrior diplomacy these incidents where Chinese envoys were storming out of international meetings, they were shouting at foreign counterparts, they were getting in Twitter spats with, uh, with US officials and, and officials from other nations. Uh, and as the coronavirus outbreak uh, occurred, they even started, started to spread conspiracy theories about the US having originated that, that outbreak. Um, and so it's become a much more mainstream topic. And if you, if anyone watched the confirmation hearings earlier this year uh, on Capitol Hill, you'll have seen that, um, you know, from Director Burns at the CIA to Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, this has become a major concern for U.S. policymakers too. Um, but, but you know, having spent so much time um, with the memoirs, I guess the thing that jumped out at me was that the, the roots of what we now call wolf warrior diplomacy go back a very, very long way. And, and really, you can trace them back to the very origins of, of the PRC. So when the People's Republic was founded in, in 1949, um, 
it basically had no diplomats to, to speak of. Um, the new communist government had kicked out uh, any of the, the nationalist diplomats who had decided to stay behind in Beijing because it believed that they were too ideologically impure to represent the new state. Um, and and the, the government, the communists, faced a kind of paradoxical challenge. On the one hand, this was a highly paranoid uh, political movement which had spent decades underground and relied on secrecy for its very survival. Um, and continued to be obsessed with outside threats to its power, um, uh, in, in, you know, in, in some measure for good reason, because it faced a, an increasingly hostile United States, an anti-communist United States, and a rival government in Taiwan, which, which, um, which claimed to be the rightful ruler of China. So on the one hand, there was this kind of paranoia and insecurity. On the other hand, there was this strong need and imperative to reach out to the world and communicate with it and to win friends and influence and establish the communists as the legitimate rulers of, of China. So to kind of square this circle, Zhou Enlai, who was uh, the PRC's first uh, premier and foreign minister, came up with this approach um, for Chinese diplomats to follow, where he said that they should act like <clears throat> the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. So they should model their behavior on the, the fighting force um, that had propelled the communists to victory. And, and what he meant by that was that they would be unfailingly loyal to the party, that they would be disciplined to a fault, and that they would display what he called a fighting spirit whenever China's interests were challenged. And that, that kind of militaristic martial ethos created um, a set of very distinctive behaviors um, which were visible in 1949 and, and many of which are still visible today. So Chinese diplomats will stick incredibly closely to talking points, even if they know that those talking points don't resonate with the people sitting across the table. They will move around in pairs um, using a, a, a system called two people walking together, R and Tongxian, to keep tabs on each other. Um, they will shout at foreign counterparts um, when they feel cornered or they worry about looking insufficiently tough to audiences back home. And they'll elevate even the smallest slights um, and, and, and problems into major international issues because they worried that, that they might look disloyal if they failed to do so. Um, and this, this kind of approach led to what we would now call wolf warrior displays right from the outset. So, um, and especially at times when China's political system and its political scene became tense and focused on ideology and focused on the leadership of the, of the paramount leader, whether that's Mao Zedong or, or Xi Jinping. So in 1950, a veteran revolutionary um, soldier called Wu Xiuquan, who had a kind of bullet scar across his forehead, he led a delegation to the United Nations in New York. And he delivered a speech which honestly makes today's wolf warriors kind of look like a bunch of wimps. Um, Time magazine described it at the time as two awful hours of rasping vituperation, uh, which gives you some sense of the, of the tone that he struck. Um, and of course, in the subsequent decade, in the 1960s, uh, Chinese diplomats um, handed out copies of Mao's little red book. They were expelled from countries ranging from Kenya to Indonesia for, for their provocative uh, behavior. And uh, one Chinese diplomat was even pictured on the streets of London wielding an ax as his colleagues fought with protesters outside the Chinese representative office. Um, so, so those wolf warrior displays have deep, deep roots, but at the same time, there is another tendency in Chinese diplomacy, which is really important. And, and, and that is this need to build influence and to charm the world. And so at other times in the PRC's history, China's diplomats have taken the extraordinary discipline that Zhou and Lai required of them, and they've applied it to, to winning friends for China. Um, and we saw China do that with great effect in the 1950s when uh, it charmed Zhou and Lai and, and Chinese diplomats charmed the developing world at 
uh, the Bandung Conference for Asian and African Nations. And we saw it with, with tremendous effect in the 1990s in the aftermath of the Tiananmen massacre, when um, China set about on this two decade charm offensive, which ultimately um, culminated in it hosting the 2008 Summer Olympics. So I, I kind of think of there being two tendencies in Chinese diplomacy, which cycle in and out. Um, there's one tendency to charm the world, and there's another tendency to use wolf warrior tactics to tell the world off. Um, and I think that, that recently we've seen quite a decisive lurch back toward um, the kind of combative assertiveness that, um, that we saw in the past. And I think that's been driven by two things. Um, a new confidence on the part of China's leaders, but also these enduring insecurities um, created by China's political system. Um, and the new confidence started, of course, in the aftermath of the, the 2008 Summer Olympics, but especially after the onset of the global financial crisis in 2008-9, when China's leaders started to look around the world at the sluggish response of Western governments to that crisis, and to contrast it with their own ability to deliver a massive economic stimulus package. Um, and, 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 it, that, and that created kind of a shift toward a more confident, assertive foreign policy and, and approach to diplomacy, which really um, accelerated after Xi Jinping became Communist Party boss in 2012. Um, and under Xi Jinping, China's political system has become an increasingly tense and uh, to some extent scary place. She has instituted a sweeping anti-corruption campaign which has punished more than 1.5 million officials. He has abolished presidential term limits, setting him up potentially as, as ruler for life. He has experimented with the use of re-education camps in China's far western region of, of Xinjiang. And he's focused on ideology at home and used uh, major speeches to emphasize um, hostility to Western influences in Chinese politics and in Chinese culture. And, and when Chinese diplomats see these signals, they, un they understand them with a kind of rich cultural and, 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 and context that we, I think, sometimes fail to grasp. You know, it's, it's important to remember that through its history, China's diplomatic corps has experienced multiple rounds of purges in which colleagues were encouraged to inform on each other. Um, in the Cultural Revolution, it reached such extremes that, uh, you know, ambassadors were locked in cellars, forced to clean toilets, and even beaten until they coughed up blood by their own diplomats. Um, and, and large numbers of Chinese diplomats were sent off to re-education camps. And so Chinese diplomats know how high the stakes can be when you get on the wrong side of, of Chinese politics. Um, so I think that kind of all of these things, this new confidence and the, the fear created by Xi Jinping's approach to politics came together to set a new tone for Chinese diplomacy. And as Chinese diplomats listened to President Xi uh, give speeches where he talked about China standing tall in the East, never giving up an inch of territory, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, China never trucking bullying by foreign powers, uh, they began to mimic that tone. And the, the ambitious ones among them uh, not only mimicked it, but even added a little extra nationalist zeal for good measure in the hopes, I think, that they might get uh, promoted. And, and that, that assertive, aggressive new tone really went into high gear after the coronavirus outbreak, when we again saw a combination of confidence and insecurity. Confidence because China's political system seemed to have, have managed the spread of the virus more effectively than um, the countries in, in North America and in Europe. And insecurity because China was now under attack right across the world for its role in the initial outbreak of uh, the virus. And the, the result was a series of outbursts, of you know, wolf warrior outbursts, uh, apparently cheered on by Xi Jinping himself, who actually sent a handwritten note to the, the foreign ministry uh, calling for more fighting spirit from Chinese diplomats. And, you know, if one diplomat has really um, become the face of this phenomenon, it's, uh, it's foreign ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian. 
And, and Zhao was this um, relatively obscure figure um, posted to the, the embassy in the Chinese embassy in Islamabad, who built up unusually at the time, quite a substantial Twitter following, um, and then picked a fight online with uh, former US national security advisor, Susan Rice. And in doing so, he kind of became an instant domestic celebrity and uh, rocketed to fame and was rewarded with uh, a promotion to this role as, as foreign ministry spokesman, a, a, something that didn't seem to have been in Zhao's career track before that moment and made him overnight uh, one of the most prominent faces, not just of China's foreign ministry, but of the whole Chinese state. Um, and, you know, since then, Zhao has pretty much offended everyone who's come across his path, but, but particularly caused consternation in the Trump White House when he suggested that the US Army had deliberately started the COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan. Um, but, you know, Zhao isn't alone. Um, Gui Tongyo, who just left his post in, in Sweden, was summoned to the country's foreign ministry 40 times in the space of two years. Um, and in an in a interview, when he was asked about this by the media, he said that uh, for our friends, we have fine wine, and for our enemies, we have shotguns, which gives you some idea of, uh, <laughs> of, of how Gui uh, views himself. And, you know, it's important to remember that not everyone in China's diplomatic circles agrees with this approach. Um, Yuan Nansheng, who is China's former consul general in San Francisco, has spoken out um, against what he sees as a trend toward extreme nationalism in, in Chinese diplomacy. And even Xi Jinping himself has kind of hinted that things might have gone too far. And he, dis he discussed uh, earlier this summer the need for China to create and cultivate a more lovable image for itself in the world, which I think is at least a tacit recognition that, that China's external propaganda efforts and its diplomacy have, have come across as more frightening than lovable in recent years. Um, but as I, as I said at the outset, um, you know, this, this approach and this combativeness has very, very deep roots and goes all the way back to the roots of the PRC. And so why don't I pause here and, and, and turn it over to, to panel discussion. Thank you so much, Peter. That gave us a real um, wonderful overview of the argument you developed so effectively in the book. I will now uh, pass the mic to uh, Professor Min Ye. Min. Uh, thank you so much to Ambassador Heine for organizing this uh, book talk. And uh, 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 I'm very glad to uh, share this uh, uh, stage with Peter and my esteemed colleague, Joe Phil Smith. Uh, and Peter, I really enjoyed reading this book. I haven't had so much fun reading a book in a very long time. Um, so, so, so really wonderfully written. And I would uh, strongly urge uh, anyone who pick up the book, go beyond the introduction. In fact, you should skip the introduction and go to the, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, the rest of the chapters. Um, and so through that, that, I will uh, uh, keep my remarks uh, as disciplined as possible, <laughs> but I hope there are opportunities to uh, exchange with you um, on other occasions. Uh, first uh, thing I want to talk about is the, 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 the topic or the sensation that made your book a sensation, which shouldn't be the right cause for the, the sensational re re reaction to the, to the book. That's the Wolf of World Diplomacy, right? So this term really came as a sensation at the heat of the pandemic, early 2020, just a few months. And then it, this became a framing that caught, uh, became the characteristic frame uh, on all Chinese diplomacy, which I think is a little bit unfortunate. And in your book, if we go beyond the introduction, it's, it actually unpacks a lot more complexity. Your uh, remark already unpacks a lot of complexity that should go beyond this term, the wording itself. But right? it's such short-lived uh, 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 rhetoric, and yet it caught on. What I think you uh, people are saying actually is the recent term or a much more confrontational as well as assertive 
diplom diplomatic trend in China that starts after 2008. Right? On that, um, I, I think the, uh, there are, uh, so the Wolf Warrior diplomacy or the so-called more confrontational, more assertive Chinese diplomacy, I think they are actually are four things. Uh, some are more durable than others. The, the first is very real, you know, so the leadership, uh, the, uh, the, 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 there, is, there has been a strong emphasis of uh, asking the Chinese uh, elites to ping shi the West, right? So looking at the West as a peer, and, be, and that's, they think it's very important at a psychological national level to make China appear and look at the West not as inferior. That for decades, uh, that has been the case, I right? say. So, so ping shi has become a major theme in the Chinese leadership emphasis on, on on, uh, over the, the, the elites, the ruling elites. The second, I do uh, sense that there has been a long built up frustration, um, a, a hidden uh, the, uh, dissatisfaction among uh, Chinese uh, diplomats, but more importantly, Chinese uh, elites in general, that they felt the Western counterparts uh, 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 have been rather uh, disrespectful of them and showing the sense of, of hubris. And because you, you mentioned like in, uh, during the reform, height of the reform, most of Chinese are very, were very nice, right? Uh, but I, I know they were not nice. They were just uh, um, not, uh, uh, not showing uh, or not sharing their frustration or their displeasure with what they observe as, as rather um, uh, disrespectful uh, hubris from the Western side. And I do see in China at the societal level, there is a, a, a large trend on nativist uh, group and that, that's, that's everywhere. So it's not just in China, uh, but those groups have always been very unhappy with the Chinese overall cultural to the West. Right? And so, so the more assertive, more confrontational uh, ways of the diplomatic expression really now speaks to this group as well. The last point I think is really the few uh, uh, political uh, entrepreneurs. I, I see these, uh, uh, the, 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 the po more, more politicized diplomatic entrepreneurs or propagandists, um, Zhao Lijing, this group actually are foreign propagandists. They are not diplomats. Right? Um, they, they are, I think they're more strategic uh, and, and optimistic and, uh, and entrepreneurial in, in taking, seizing the opportunity for their professional advancement and advantage, uh, rather than I think being forced into doing something. Right? So, so that, that's uh, the four, four things that I think underlie this, this increasing uh, assertiveness or, or confrontational styles from the Chinese uh, diplomatic uh, face. That on the on the on the book again, I really uh, uh, want to emphasize uh, the the richness of the book and the personalities and Zhou Enlai. Um, I, I think Zhou Enlai should be really you should you should write a book on Zhou Enlai's uh, diplomatic philosophy uh, itself because it's just a it, it's such. It's such a strong tradition of, 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 of the diplomatic uh, creation, you know, from rebel to the ruler, and uh, and from the party to power, right? And that that's that's very uh, different task goals, and and you can imagine that the thousands of generations of diplomats all taking the instructions from Joe. So 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 that history is really uh, fascinating, uh, but I think because uh, your uh, your book is uh, it emphasize the drama, right? Emphasize the the the, the the personalities um, and, and uh, 
uh, so I feel like you are missing the larger, more boring bureaucratic aspects of the, the uh, diplomatic uh, folks, right? Um, because you, may, you, you actually covered a lot of very interesting figures in the book, uh, but there are thousands of thousands of uh, uh, diplomats. And as I said, there are propaganda lists and then there are real diplomats, right? So you have for every one uh, Zhao Lijian, there will be thousands, right? Right, these uh, 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 young civil servants, uh, basically well trained, well, very, very well trained, constantly getting new training and and, and doing their their task, uh, and very effectively. Uh, they they have the Zhao Liqing type, you know, take on the the fight with Western media, but they are quietly working on this. So, so I think in your story, I don't know how that that will take away the the interest in, in, um, the the fascinating aspect of your your book. But but if you want to present your book as as some kind of real um, educational piece on China's diplomacy, I feel like the the more professional side, very experienced, very efficient. Uh, thousands of diplomats uh, who actually are doing their work very, very effectively. Uh, and one thing I feel I'll end with this one, um, it, it's kind of running through the, um, the, uh, the, the book and also uh, mentioned in your remark that so uh, the, the goal of, of diplomacy, right? Uh, I, I, I think you're you, you, you kind of feel that the goals of diplomacy is to uh, get, uh, win hearts and minds or a, a diplomats uh, operating outside should uh, 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 win hearts and minds in the society, right? So, so that a premise um, uh, it, it, it's fine, but I also feel like on the diplomats, the big, the the main goal is to uh, to express their 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 government positions, their foreign policy, and get their foreign policy objectives done. Right, the the goal of winning hearts and mind that's God's job or it's missionary job, and not the government agency's job. So from that point of view, I wonder whether the Chinese bureaucratic style of foreign policy um, uh, 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 is more professional right, than, than, than those, uh, 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 those system. Actually, uh, maybe American system, that's more unique, right? Having these a lot of individuals not aware, as well trained, but conducting their own missions on the, on the side. Uh, 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 my big point is uh, uh, whether uh, the, the, the diplomats we should treat them as state agencies and their, their most dominant goals is really conveying uh, the, the policy positions of their, of their state. So they may lose some hearts and mind in some incidents, but over the long run, uh, they are, uh, they are uh, performing and achieving uh, their, their mission that they were, they were sent out to be. With that, uh, more positive notes than you, I will uh, hand uh, to my colleague, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Phil Smith. Thank you very much, Men. Uh, mm -hmm. So now, um, Professor Phil Smith, the floor is yours. I, I was wondering if you wanted to give Peter a chance to respond to, to Men first, and then I can come in later, or however you uh, like to do it. Well, the, the idea would be uh, to, give a chance, uh, to give a chance to Peter to respond uh, once he has heard. Um, okay. All of the comments. Okay. I, I have no problem. Uh, uh, I, I think I have a, a couple of fairly simple questions that kind of pick up a little bit on some of uh, Professor Ye's uh, points here. Um, you, one of the interesting themes in the book, I think, is the real discipline of these diplomats, uh, highly uh, trained. Um, as Min says, highly uh, uh, responsible, uh, you know, um, they certainly are loyal to their country. Um, and yet, um, you know, Zhou Enlai himself was something of a freelancer. Uh, in your book, you talk a little bit about uh, his performance in Indonesia at the Bandung Conference, uh, which is really sort of China's first um, coming out party, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's right after um, the Korean War. It's right after the um, offshore island dispute in the Taiwan Straits. 
And so China has a terrible global reputation at that time. And Nehru goes to Bandung as sort of the, um, what, the um, icon of the non-aligned movement. And I think Nehru assumes that everybody will swoon before him. And Zhou Enlai comes in and, as you say, tosses aside his prepared remarks and says, uh, we're here to um, bring people together, not to separate them. And his performance was bravo uh, and something of a, I, I don't know, an extemporaneous uh, performance. Um, so, you know, you have this sort of tension right from the beginning of the highly disciplined Zhou Enlai going out and freelancing. And, you know, I, I, I don't know whether that really connects or not with your diplomats in the Cultural Revolution, where things have changed dramatically at home. And they're going out and, you know, some of them probably don't know which side to, to pick on at first. Um, uh, and some of them decide to make their, their uh, mark with the, uh, I guess you'd say the, uh, the rebels, and they will go out and denounce their ambassador, something that must turn Hori Hainan's uh, blood uh, must, must chill him. <laughs> the idea that your own staff would turn and lock you in the in the basement. Uh, how can this happen? Uh, these guys are are placing bets uh, on which way the political um, wind is going to go. And instead of being this very disciplined hierarchical organization, all of a sudden they're freelancing. And you know that you know. There is something of a parallel, which you kind of hint at, but maybe don't pursue um, quite enough in your book between Zhao Lijian and these cultural revolution rebels. Uh, is, is Zhao Lijian uh, freelancing um, it, while making up the story about uh, the US Army, perhaps uh, sowing the coronavirus in Wuhan, suggests that he is. I mean, as you say, he didn't check with his superiors. He just made this up on the spot and uh, decided to implement uh, a conspiracy theory. Um, you know, is, is there something about Xi Jinping's leadership that is encouraging some of these maybe younger diplomats to go out and freelance? Um, obviously we're not at a cultural revolution pitch but there's something going on here that has at least a, a resemblance to that period. Uh, and maybe you could elaborate a bit more on, on that. Um, I suppose that what intrigues me the most about this so-called wolf warrior diplomacy is that it's really hurt China's image. I mean, badly. Uh, you know, the, the Pew study that everybody uh, refers to these days um, suggests that Throughout the OECD, uh, public opinion has really turned against China. And, you know, if you go back, um, well, I guess it's more than 10 or 20 years, uh, about 20 years ago, the so-called new security concept uh, in, um, in, in, well, there was brewed in ASEAN, you know, the whole idea that China was a responsible uh, power, that it was peaceful development, that uh, China's rise is not going to hurt the interests of Southeast Asian nations. And it really was a charm offensive that I thought was really quite convincing. Um, and so what is it about that charm offensive that the Chinese government felt didn't work? Um, that now you had to go from a highly effective strategy to one that tr really hurts China's interests. Um, it's, it's very intriguing. And, uh, you know, in a sense, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, obviously, there were some major problems in the interim, including the, the bombing of the Belgrade embassy, um, which I think had a major impact. Uh, you know, Americans have very short memories. So most people probably have long since forgotten the Belgrade bombing. But I assure you, uh, people in the foreign ministry have not. Um, so, you know, there are these turning points. Nevertheless, um, diplomacy is supposed to help your nation, not hurt it. And they seem to be doing 
um, damage. Uh, this would be uh, what you call an own goal. So I, I, I think those are lots of comments that you can respond to. And uh, so I'll just leave it to you and uh, come back and have a conversation. Thank you, Professor Fusmith. Uh, I will now uh, add a few uh, comments uh, of my own and then uh, turn over uh, the mic to uh, Peter for him to respond and then uh, get to the uh, Q&A. Um, let me, we have now had uh, the perspective of a noted journalist of two distinguished scholars. Uh, let me bring in the perspective of a practitioner, uh, somebody who was for 12 years ambassador, including uh, three and a half years in Beijing uh, to this issue. Uh, it seems to me it's important to set this in a comparative perspective. Uh, in many countries around the world, and especially in the Anglosphere, ambassadors and diplomats have become punching balls of populist politicians, seen as real embodiments of globalizations and everything that is wrong with it. Um, at the height of the Trump administration, one third of all senior positions in the State Department went unfilled. As President Biden attended the G20 summit uh, almost a year into his administration, he must have realized, I think the US is ambassadors in only four of the 20 countries that uh, are part of the G20. In my country, Chile, there's not been a US ambassador in post for four years now. Now, in this context, what we are seeing, and uh, Peter highlights it in the book, albeit in passing, is that China is doing exactly the opposite. China has been increasing the budget of the foreign ministry considerably. Um, as I said earlier, it is now the country with the largest number of foreign missions abroad, surpassing uh, the United States. And, you know, apart from the question of uh, this uh, aggressiveness, that has been highlighted. I myself, I must say, I don't believe in aggressive behavior as a diplomatic tool. In my own experience, uh, it is not a productive approach to doing business with other countries. There's a reason why Bismarck said uh, famously, diplomacy is the art of making friends abroad. That said, it seems to me, it is important to keep in mind that uh, what China is doing. At a time, some of you may remember the phrase Peter Yustinov said some years ago, a diplomat these days is a head waiter who is occasionally allowed to sit. China is doing exactly the opposite. Wolf war diplomacy or not, China has empowered ambassadors. Uh, they have given more powers to ambassadors to manage the many agencies that are represented uh, in post. It has given them more leeway. And I find this quite fascinating. Uh, the narrative that we hear is that whatever they do is parrot the Beijing line, parrot whatever Xi Jinping says, parrot whatever the foreign ministry says. Well, I will tell you the following. If you are on Twitter, Parroting is not what you are able to do. You must answer immediately. You cannot get back to Beijing and say, what am I supposed to answer to this uh, tweet? You can't, you are on your own. So the notion that in social media, you can just sort of parrot, to my mind, having you know done it myself, it doesn't work. So this whole approach uh, on the social media side, implies empowering heads of mission, empowering ambassadors in a way that was not the case in the past and certainly in a way that is not uh, the case in, in other ministries. So it seems to me that what China is doing in this latest phase, in empowering heads of mission, in giving them quite a bit of leeway in managing the relations with that particular country is quite different from what we've seen in many other countries around the world in which the role of the ambassador has been steadily minimized and curtailed. There is an insight there. 
China has realized that it is very important to have a face in any given country representing your country in that that face can make an enormous difference. Let me end with a reference to Latin America. Uh, comments have been made about various polls that have been made in Europe about the uh, decline of the Chinese image in, in public opinion, and that is no doubt the case. But I will say this, in the course of the past few years in Latin America, and I've been able to follow this very closely, uh, Chinese diplomacy has been extremely effective under very difficult circumstances throughout the pandemic, under very strong pressure from Washington. Chinese ambassadors uh, through social media in their dealings with government have managed to make tremendous headway. And uh, in even governments that came to power on an ostensibly anti-China plank, like President Bolsonaro in Brazil, has ended up uh, changing his behavior once in power and working very closely with China. And similar things can be said about quite a number of other countries in Latin America. So um, I would add a lot of caution to the comments that have been made until now. And in the case of Latin America, I would argue quite strongly uh, the situation of uh, Chinese diplomacy and Chinese foreign policy is quite different from the one that obtains um, in Europe uh, today. With that, I will turn over the uh, mic to Peter. Peter, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, and and what a what a great array of um, of comments. I'm gonna uh, struggle to get through all the the responses I'd like without without completely taking up too much time. So I'll try to be as brief um, as I can. Um, I think in, in terms of Professor Ye's uh, comments, uh, I, I, I love that she picked up on the, the role of Zhou Enlai. And um, I really did find him to be a very captivating figure. And um, the, the, the best kind of analogy I could think of for the, the role that he played in Chinese diplomacy and continues to play is uh, J. Edgar Hoover at the FBI. You know, an example of someone whose who's philosophy, but also whose personality kind of permeates an institution even long after um, they've passed from the political scene. Um, and I, I think that that's the case with Joe. You know, you think of the extraordinary attention to detail that, that, that Chinese diplomats have. I think that's something that very much mimics Joe's, um, Joe's own approach. And this, this incredible self-control and, and discipline as well, I think um, is, is something that can be traced back to him. Um, in terms of the role of diplomacy, I mean, it was really interesting to hear three slightly different perspectives from, from the other panelists. My, my starting point is that um, if, if the task of diplomats is only to deliver messages, then why have diplomats at all? You could simply hand out notes. So there's got to be something that diplomats do actively to, to change the situation and, and to work for their country's interests. And, and the, the, my favorite definition that I heard was from um, the legendary um, US diplomat um, Chaz Freeman, um, who was uh, a, a, an interpreter for, for Richard Nixon when he visited Mao's China and then went on to serve as US ambassador to Indonesia and uh, Saudi Arabia, I think, a bunch of other places. But um, you know, he said that he thinks of diplomacy as a, as a political performance art, where your, your objective is to persuade the other person in the room that it's in their best interests to follow a policy course that you favor. Um, and you do that by um, not just reiterating your talking points, but, but kind of using your decades of historical ex you know, of experience in country, your knowledge of the country's history and its culture, and, and also taking the temperature in the room at that moment and, and combining all of those things with the message that you have to deliver and making it more palatable to the person across the table. And, you know, I think one of the, the great strengths of Chinese diplomats, as Professor Ye said, is this ability to very clearly communicate China's message. But I think they struggle when it comes to taking that message and making it acceptable to the person across the table. Um, 
and and on on, on this issue of their day to day existence being very bu- boring and bureaucratic, I completely agree, and uh, it's actually something that shines through very strongly from the the memoirs. You know, most of which are kind of structured like there was one meeting and then I went to another meeting and that was followed by a subsequent meeting where talking points were discussed you know it's quite it's it's quite tedious and and there was one diplomat actually who said that um in her in her memoir that that pe- people don't grasp just how dull the day-to-day can be for for diplomats posted overseas and there was another um posted to a series of pacific islands throughout his career who uh, was was kind of literally bored to tears um, with his existence in those places. And at one point he heard um, the Chinese national anthem come through on a speaker system and he started crying because he hadn't heard it in so long and hadn't spoken to another Chinese person in so long. So I, I as, as you say, that stuff is hard to translate into an interesting book, um, but uh, it's it's very important and it's, it's a part of their, their lived experience, I think. Um, On Professor Fusmith's point, um, there is this irony that Joe and Lai set up um, such an extraordinarily disciplined system with this this focus on following orders and that the measure in many ways of a successful Chinese diplomat over time has been that ability to do as you're told and to do so exactly as you're told. Um, but, uh, But Joe... And, and to some extent, some, you know, people like Qian Chi Chen as well, China's best diplomats have been people who have been able to take that tight leash and just stretch it enough to be effective um, on the global stage. And it's not, it's not something that China's system, um, you know, is particularly good at cultivating, but it is something that I think is necessary for good diplomacy. And in, in the case of Zhou, of course, his personal stature in Chinese politics made that possible. And for Qian Chi Chen, I think, you know, his status as someone on the, on the Politburo. Um, uh, of course, all of, none of his successes until Yang Jiechen managed to make it back up to that elevated a role in Chinese politics, but also the fact that, that Chen um, joined the party. I think he, if I remember correctly, he joined age 16 in a phone booth. Uh, you know, so he was, he was someone who was a real revolutionary. He wasn't just a, a, a kind of foreign service bureaucrat and um and I, I you know i think that i think chinese diplomacy would be better served if it if it left a little room for to people for people to to improvise a bit more but unfortunately that's not something that the system rewards very much um in terms of of of, of jiao um freelancing i do think that this is um so jiao li jin we, we talked about his 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 spreading the the coronavirus conspiracy theory on Twitter. And, you know, my, my understanding is that he didn't ask permission before he did that. And um, that's really extraordinary when you step back and think about it. You know, US-China relations are the sole preserve of the paramount leader. You know, foreign policy is a sensitive policy area and US-China relations is the most sensitive part of that. And, and so it's unthinkable that someone who's a deputy DG level official could just make up China's US policy on the spot. But that does seem to be what Zhao did. And I, I think that that does kind of cut to a paradox, which is at the heart of um, wolf warrior diplomacy in, 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 in many ways, because especially, especially as Jorge said, when it, when it plays out on Twitter, because... Um, you know, it, it, she's kind of broader political project is all about uh, discipline and hierarchy and creating a kind of functional Leninist state where the rip of the Communist Party runs through institutions ranging from government institutions, uh, go, you know, uh, government bureaucracies through to state-owned enterprises and even even civil society and private companies. And so, the idea that there's any space in there for for freelancing is 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 pretty hard to fathom. And I've I've long been confused about how that element of wolf warrior diplomacy has persisted on Twitter and have expected not not necessarily a recalibration of tone, because I think Xi Jinping seems to like the assertive tone, but uh, but an effort to cut out the freelancing and introduce some consistency. And, 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 and maybe we'll start to see evidence for that. There's a study being done um, at University College Dublin to 
trace the tweets of Chinese diplomats before and after Xi Jinping's remarks at the Politburo study session where he he talked about that backlash to China's opinion. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see what the results of that study show and whether that's led to any any greater degree of discipline. But I agree, it's 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 an odd paradox to see that that level of freelancing. And, and then I guess just just kind of finally um, on the issue of why China hasn't changed tack and, and why it seems to have just so wholeheartedly abandoned this um, approach to, you know, this, this far more successful charm approach that it pursued in, in recent years. Um, there are a whole, whole bunch of things going on. And I think all of the, all of the panelists touched on them. I think one really crucial element there is the way that Chinese elites assess their own power and the way that they assess um, the likely fate of Western political systems. So I think that when you, you know you look at the kind of copy that Xinhua and um, CGTN and other outlets put out about the, the political dysfunction of Western democracies and the rise of populism and endemic racism and social unrest and all of these things that they emphasize. I think that, you know, some of that is for propaganda purposes, but some of it really does represent a view in Beijing that um, there's something profoundly wrong with the way that Western political systems are functioning and that China's time has come. And I think until that um, calculus is, is, is shifted a little bit, it's quite hard to imagine China going back to a uh, a more low-key approach to diplomacy simply because they think that they don't need to, you know. I, um, I, I remember one of the last conversations I had with the Chinese diplomat before I left um, Beijing was with someone who didn't like this new approach, but he said there are a lot of people um, in China's system who believe that China doesn't need soft power anymore because its economic and military might will simply change the minds of others and it doesn't need to ask permission. Anyway, I know that there are a bunch of questions, so I'm going I'm to stop rambling there and um, look forward to answering some of the questions. Great. Thank you, Peter. Okay, so let us uh, start with the following question. Um, and uh, any of the uh, panelists can pick them up, or we may start with Peter. Question, how would you view Chinese senior diplomats towards the U.S. counterparts during the Anchorage meeting in Alaska earlier this year? Will that kind of hostile scenery demonstrated by both sides continue to happen in the future? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think that um, the the way that the Anchorage summit was set up in many ways kind of almost like invited a wolf warrior display from Chinese diplomats. They had been they had spent the the previous four years listening to people like former Secretary of State Michael Pompeo, uh, you know. Of kind of trash talking the CCP, saying that it wasn't legitimate, that it ruled China. China. And, uh, you, you know, really, really, uh, really, really laying into um, the Chinese system of governance, and they they relished Yang Jiechi, um the the Politburo member I mentioned earlier, really relished the chance, I think, to set the record straight a little bit and and vent in public. And his remarks, I think, were. Um, probably like most displays of wolf warrior diplomacy were aimed at people back in Beijing. Um, there was a, a desire to show that, uh, you know, Chinese diplomats won't be bullied or pushed around and that they're gonna stand up for China's interests. And so I think Zhao kind of seized that opportunity with both hands. But my understanding of what transpired subsequently was that once the cameras left the room and he had the chance to give his 17 minute diatribe, um, he kind of settled into a very professional and um, uh, constructive tone, which persisted for the rest of the meeting, which is is really a testament, I think, to um, his, you know, his extraordinary self-control. He's someone who can turn on a dime from being charming and funny and friendly to just withering and, and slightly terrifying. And um, he demonstrated it at Anchorage. Hey, thank you. Um, Professor Fusman, would you like to address that issue as well? Um, well, I, as Peter said, I think that this is, um, it is part of China's diplomacy at this moment, uh, especially that first 
senior meeting between Chinese diplomats and American diplomats. Um, yeah, I, I guess I didn't uh, did not expect it to go particularly well, uh, at least publicly. Um, I would say that the performance of Yang Jiechi exceeded my expectations. Um, you know, I I think that it's I think the question is really how both sides carry on from there. Uh, and so far, we don't seem to have been able to really sit down in the same room and talk about common interests. Uh, you know, I think that, well, I happen to be focusing a lot on the Taiwan issue these days. And, you know, for what, 70 years, the two sides have been able to manage a very, very difficult question. Um, you know, the U.S. has been doing uh, some things, including now we know uh, the training of, of um, military personnel in Taiwan that clearly provoke China. Um, and we seem to believe that a, a military approach will manage this problem. And it, it's provocative. There's no particular reason for it. Um, on the other hand, China has been very provocative itself. And, you know, you really need to sort of sit down in a room, uh, maybe uh, with lower level diplomats at first, and, and try to work out some, some sort of way to manage a sensitive problem like that. Because that, that could, as you know, just blow up the entire relationship, not to mention the whole stability of the Western Pacific. Let so, me add yes, a, I, sorry. Let me expect, add a, I, I, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Hori. Uh, let me add a, a footnote to that. Uh, I was struck by reporting in the press on the telephone call. That I think it was a 90 minute telephone call between President Biden and President Xi. And uh, sort of the reporting indicated something along the following lines. Since our diplomats have not been able to make much progress, neither in the meeting held in Alaska, nor in the follow-up meeting held with um, Deputy Secretary Wendy Sherman in Tianjin, which apparently didn't go very well either. The presidents tried to sort things out by themselves. Now, I was struck by that. It's supposed to be the other way around. It, mm. It's the diplomats that are supposed to sort out things and then for the president to come in and sign and appear before the press and the cameras and so on. And the fact that it, it's supposed to be the presidents now that have to sort things out indicates there's a real problem. Uh, Professor Ye, would you like to add something to this? Uh, I, I, I'll add a uh, thing that I think uh, uh, also relates to other a couple of questions in oh, the in the in, in the in the chat, um, Please, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, the, so. It's been a while. The domestic politics, not only in China, U.S., but also other uh, countries, have risen so saliently in foreign policy. So there are fundamental shift that uh, all the the diplomats have and foreign policy are really being hijacked a lot by domestic politics, right? Um, on that, so we, we kind of see the change in China, but the chain, a lot of Chinese change is reactive, right? So the, 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 the Pompeo and, and, and Trump administration's um, uh, whole overall portrayal of China as enemy and the promotion of the all government uh, com confrontation with China, um, that that really changed the whole external environment uh, surrounding China. So we kind of are reminiscent of uh, why China is not doing the Trump offensive anymore, why China is not being nice anymore. That's because the the the, the environment for Trump offensive actually is very it is quickly narrowing. The, the, the BRI and other uh, multilateral initiatives that China joined in the last uh, uh, a few years are efforts to do China offensive. But every move that they have would be interpreted as adversary strategy. 
and then every uh, and a lot, that creates a lot of backlash in the recipients as well, right? So the Victoria in New Zealand uh, abandoned BRI uh, agreement and that would be celebrated. And then Luciana uh, the, in, in the 16 plus one um, uh, 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 agreement between China and the Central Eastern Europeans uh, were also, so there are, the trauma offensive. So that's where I think I, I mentioned uh, in, the, in my opening uh, comments, that is there are a lot of efforts that are done by Chinese diplomats uh, here and there, trying to recreating uh, a, a more um, a bounded uh, uh, international relations, but the, the uh, the possibility or the feasibility is uh, is not there anymore. Um, I, I think the U.S. really has holds holds the upper hand. Um, uh, the 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 reason the Trump offensive worked in the mid 2000s right? I, I studied those. That's because the U.S. was promoting responsive responsive stakeholder, not the China was promoting, uh, and now the U.S. was uh, seeing China as an enemy. And so it's very clear in the BRI process as well. Anything that China proposes would be met with a confrontational uh, proposal uh, uh, from, the, from the, the, the United States. And the US holds the discursive power and holds the upper hand. So, so I think if we, um, if we want to see uh, that the, 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 the ch trends change in China, which is a more moderate, uh, the, the more professional uh, diplomats holding more voice, more influence, more improvising on the positive side, then the external environment needs to change uh, 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 too. It will, uh, otherwise, it will be uh, it will be uh, much harder to see uh, any uh, improvement. You know, if you are trying to make China uh, view China as enemy, I think for a very long time the U.S. Uh, uh, in dealing with China, no relation first. Right? You identify, and this is a very Chinese uh, philosophical thinking or, 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 or policy. That is, you define relation, then you do things. And the relations are defined as enemy. Um, then you, 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 how can you have any kind of cooperation uh, with enemy? So that's why. So I think at one point, as I read uh, a lot of uh, uh, Peter's um, uh, chapters, you, you, you say they, they call friends, right? So you have, you are, you are my old friends. That actually, in the Chinese context, that's fundamental. Because once they say, if you are friends, then you can criticize me. Uh, you, you can ask me for things. And I do things for you, uh, and ask you for things. Right? So, the, so the Chinese way is define relationship first, and then do things later. And now, I think the Chinese uh, concluded uh, that, uh, based on the the four years under Trump, that the relationship with the United States is basically an adversary, and uh, and this is is uh, uh, is, is is no longer a, a friendly. Uh, relationship, then it will be much harder. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Professor Ye. I have another question that picks up uh, very much on, on this point, and I'd be uh, keen uh, to hear uh, Peter's perspective on this. Question is, is the aggressiveness of China's foreign policy innately entwined in the current governance, or is it deemed reactive to perceive American aggressiveness? Sorry, unmute there. Um, I, I think it's a mixture of the two. Um, I think that, um, you know, it, we sort of discussed earlier how the, the assertiveness or aggressiveness or however you want to describe it has, has kind of been building since 2008-9, further after Xi Jinping came to power, um, you know, built, I think, after the Trump administration came in and then even further um, after the coronavirus outbreak. And so a lot of that is, is driven on the by, by the Chinese side, by the, the way that Xi Jinping has articulated his vision for China's place in the world and the way that he has um, instigated changes in the Chinese political system, which have um, created an environment where diplomats feel safest if they're being nationalist and um, 
assertive and abrasive. So a lot of that comes from the domestic side. But there's no question, I think, that um, the tactics of um, the attitudes of foreign governments and especially the attitude of the Trump administration did make a big difference. And, you know, I was I was talking earlier about Mike Pompeo's um, remarks about China and and he he really became this, you know, I, and I sat in these briefings in the foreign ministry in Beijing, just these extraordinary personal attacks on Secretary Pompeo, um, which were, you know, unlike anything I've really ever seen toward a senior foreign leader, especially someone who apparently has you know, presidential ambitions one day. But I think the foreign ministry behaved that way because Secretary Pompeo attacked the CCP's ruling legitimacy, which is really the reddest and the thickest of red, red lines um, for, for Chinese officials. And so the only way to respond to that as a good CCP member and, a, you know, a, a loyal servant to the party is to come out swinging and just you know, counterattack with as much force as, as possible. And so I think some instances of wolf warrior diplomacy were absolutely very, very defensive in, in that way. I think others, a lot of the Twitter outbursts, the fist fight that Chinese diplomats got themselves into in Fiji, it's quite hard to see those as, as kind of defensive moves. I think those are, those are much more kind of calculated um, outbursts. Very good, thank you. I have another question. Um, do you think China's government gives more slack to certain ambassadors to freelance than others? Are more restrictive measures placed on ambassadors in sensitive regions? Peter, did you come across anything like that in your extensive research? Yeah, I mean, I don't, um, I don't know if I have a comprehensive answer to it. I guess a, a couple of things. Um, come to, I mean, the, 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 first, the, the, the main thing I guess that comes to mind is that the, the more sensitive the issue and the more control that the central government leadership demands over the issue, the less room there is to freelance. So I don't, I don't know if it's, so, so no, you know, Taiwan is like the preeminent example of this, right? No Chinese envoy anywhere in the world has any room to uh, to freelance on the Taiwan Taiwan issue at all. There is one set of talking points. There's one set of policies that everyone must follow to the letter, and to an extraordinary extent, uh, Chinese diplomats do follow that to the letter. Um, there are some relationships. The U.S. China relationship comes to mind, where almost every aspect of it is sensitive and demands a great deal of attention from senior leaders. And so I think on the whole, despite Zhao Lijin's tactics, on the whole, those sensitive relationships also provide a little bit less space. Maybe in relationships like, uh, you know, with, with African nations where there's a great deal of infrastructure spending and there's a lot to discuss on particular projects that might be managed by state-owned enterprises or multiple government agencies from Beijing, including the foreign ministry, but not limited to the foreign ministry. Maybe there's a little bit more space to freelance there. Not much, but maybe a little bit more than, uh, than relationships that are, that are dominated by those very sensitive issues. Very good. Thank you. I have, we are running out of time, but we have one uh, last question that I will um, pose um, to Peter and to the uh, speakers. Um, question the following. How do you see the implications of wolf warrior diplomacy in China's multilateral diplomacy? China has pressed very hard on the Taiwan issue in multilateral fora, but has often been slow to engage major multilateral institutions. Um, ironically, China's biggest opening was with the World Health Organization, where China had its first major IODG in Margaret Chen. Now China finds itself pushing back as the World Health Organization edges towards requesting more information on what happened with the origins of the coronavirus. So, Bottom line, world foreign diplomacy and multilateral organizations. Peter. Yeah, I mean, so I'll do it as quickly as possible. I think that, um, as Professor Ye said, most Chinese diplomats, most of the time, especially in forums like multilateral organizations, are quite disciplined and quite professional. And so we've seen some high profile examples of world foreign diplomacy at the UN in New York and, and in, in Geneva and other places. Um, but but most of the time they've kind of kept their heads down. I so so I don't I don't know that wolf warrior diplomacy has hurt them there in a very sort of 
uh, direct way. But I think the big the big problem for them in forums like that is the indirect damage. You know, these these institutions are made up of nation states, which are staffed by governments and political elites, which are very alarmed by Chinese diplomacy. And um, Wolf Warrior diplomacy, I think, for a lot of those elites has kind of put a human face on the assertive policies that China's taken in its neighborhood, uh, militarily, its industrial policies, all of these things that were upsetting foreign audiences, Wolf Warrior diplomacy has kind of crystallized them. And as those nation states turn against China, so too it becomes harder for China to pursue its um, objectives inside those institutions. And so I kind of see that as the, as the main impact. Very good. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time. So I will ask you, to join me in thanking our speakers for this very illuminating uh, and sharp discussion about a topic of such significance today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Professor Hugh Smith. Thank you, Min. Have a good day and uh, we'll be in touch. The Pardee School uh, will always be following what you're doing. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>